Well, welcome. I have a few um, thank yous and acknowledgements to make before, before I, I launch into my, uh, my presentation uh, this afternoon. Um, I, we really must acknowledge the very generous supporters of this uh, celebration. Uh, we're celebrating the centenary, that seems amazing, the centenary of the, of the establishment of the Group of Seven. Um, their uh, first exhibition opened on May the 7th of uh, 1920. So this whole year we've set aside for basically a very long party, which we're all going to enjoy very much indeed. Our exhibition partner um, is the Dalglish Family Foundation. And I should say that Camilla, Camilla and Peter Dalglish have been exceptional champions uh, of our Group of Seven exhibitions here over the past few years, including, uh, indeed, the Fitzgerald exhibition, which I hope all of you saw and have been through today. It's currently on view upstairs. The exhibition sponsors um, are the Masters Gallery, the McLean Foundation, the McMichael Volunteer Committee, Bolton Mills Retirement Community, Rand and Linda Lomas, my thanks to them. And we have a Group of Seven Circle, a group of supporters called the Group of Seven Circle, and that is the Manili family, uh, Carl and Jennifer Spies. Hello, Carl. Uh, Carl is a member of our foundation board and chair of our development committee. And one thing I, I would just like to say is, uh, I hope you've noticed, if you've been through the exhibition already, uh, at, in the foyer, the, the little area after Gallery One, there are two paintings. This exhibition is mainly, uh, is entirely from our own collections, with that exception, those two paintings, and one of them is belonging to Carl and Jennifer. And there's a story attached to why those two paintings are there, and I, I encourage you to go and read it. There's a, there's a handout down there. It's a, it's a lovely story. My thanks to Carl and Jennifer. And the McMichael Canadian Art Collection members, so thank you to them. Contributions were also made in memory of Robert Dowsett, uh, Harry and Catherine Angus, John Banks and Pamela Gibson, Michael and Karen Johnston, thank you. And financial assistance was received from the Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund. Our media partner, and this should be no surprise to anyone who opened the, pa the page this morning, is the Globe and Mail. Uh, and didn't it look wonderful? Uh, the middle page devoted to this exhibition this morning. I'd also like to, um, uh, to acknowledge the, the Luthiers. Um, many of you will remember the Group of Seven guitar project from the summer before last, and some of them are here with us today. And you'll be delighted to learn that the guitars are going on display in May to mark that official uh, centenary of the, 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 for the 100th anniversary of the group. Um, I know that will be very popular. Um, so my thanks uh, to all those sponsors and my thanks uh, to all of you for coming today. I know you could be at home watching the impeachment trial or, <laughs> or paint drying, whichever appealed to you most. Um, <clears throat> and many of you I know are, are regular supporters of, of the collection. I have some personal thanks. Um, this, uh, as you know, I had, a, I was, um, had an illness last year and I, I, th this was my first project coming back. It took me a while to get back into my, to my stride. And I, I really do therefore need to thank my partner, Eric, um, Eric Pearson, sitting down here. Thank you. <laughs> Eric is uh, an exhibition designer, and that, he is why the, the gallery looks really so beautiful, I think, at, at the moment. But in this case, um, as I was limping my way to, to full health again, uh, he really I think should be given uh, acknowledgement as co-curator because he helped me throughout the whole process. I'd also like to thank Greg Humenyuk who, who is, uh, has been working on, on labels. Labels will be going up over time. We just wanted to get the thing open today. So there's an awful lot of research that's gone into this and my thanks to Greg who helped enormously. And um, of course the whole curatorial team here, uh, they know who they are. They, they are an extraordinary professional group and, and they, they helped me through this whole process, uh, led by their uh, brilliant chief curator, Sarah Milroy. We're lucky to have her. So, um, finally, I can get on to, to my talk. Um, you will all know, probably, that uh, I'm, I'm kind of here because of an exhibition I did now 10 years ago, nearly 10 years ago, Painting Canada, which uh, I... I uh, I was the lead curator for that show, and um, that was when I was director of Dulwich Picture Gallery back in London, UK. 
And um, I, uh, I, it, it was an interesting process for me. Ten years ago, from this date, I was deep in, in the process of actually trying to learn as much as I could about the Group of Seven. I had come over to Canada and I'd asked all the, the, the leading scholars I could think of and knew of if they would do a show for me at Dulwich. Um, and they all kind of said no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't know what to do, really. And eventually it was David Thompson, funnily enough, who, who said to me, you're going to have to do it yourself, Ian. And I, so I kind of knuckled down and did. But I freely confess that in, in uh, 10 years ago, I used to wander around with, my, um, with a list on my mobile phone of, this, of the group of seven, because I could never get past five. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but seven is a very hard number. I hope I could do it now, but please don't test me. Um, I should be able to reel out all ten of the group of seven without any hesitation now. But nonetheless, um, there are some r real differences um, between then and now. Obviously, I know a lot more now. I said, well, you, sh you should hope so. <laughs> but um, there are very considerable differences between that exhibition of which I'm very proud, and this exhibition, which I'm equally proud. But primarily, of course, it's all from one collection. Um, the McMichael Collection has over 2,000 works associated with the Group of Seven. And that, of course, includes extraordinary objects, not just paintings and drawings, but things like um, Fred Varley's old woolen toque. Um, <laughs> believe me, you don't want to see it. <laughs> It's truly horrible. Anyway, but we have an awful lot of memorabilia associated with them as well, but it's an enormous, it's an enormous well of extraordinary work that you can dip into. It made my life so much easier. Instead of actually having to look through millions of books and, and visit all sorts of collections, you can just do the whole thing from one collection. How wonderful is that? The other difference is that um, I was able to do a, an exhibition from every period of all the artists. And uh, that's very different. For Painting Canada, I really did stop, one exception, I did stop at 1933. So it was really the, the works from, say, 1910 to 1933. In, in this case, I've been able to go right up to the, to, um, the 1960s, at least. I think the, the latest painting is about 1967. We'll see it in a minute. Um, one thing that is very different and that I'm very relieved about is that Lismer, Arthur Lismer, gets a fair shot in this show. I always felt guilty that Painting Canada didn't do him justice. There were various reasons for that. Um, I was incredibly lucky with the loans for that show. Everybody was remarkably generous, but for some reason, Lismer was the one artist where I had several key loans turned down. And there were good reasons for it at the time, which I shan't go into. I, it wasn't arbitrary. It was, uh, people were generous in every other respect. But Lismer suffered a little. And I always felt I didn't really plug that gap properly. So, so I'm able to apologize to him, um, as it were, with this exhibition. And of course, the other key difference is that I have been able, in this show, to actually include the three later members, um, uh, Cass and Holgate and Fitzgerald. They are part of this display. Uh, I missed them out from the first, uh, from Painting Canada, because I felt that the British had no idea who the Group of Seven were anyway. And if I went to them and said, well, actually, the, there are 10 in the Group of Seven, I, I thought they'd run amok. Um, so I, I let them off the hook there. I've learned lots of lessons over the 10 years since I, I, I was wandering around with my iPhone checking on who Frank Johnston was. Um, I do have, you'll be relieved to learn, a much better idea of the broader context of, of Canadian art. It's been one of the great joys of my life to rediscover a completely new Canadian art history, which I didn't know before. And it keeps, this is the gift that keeps giving. I, I, I'm just so honored to be here. And I mentioned Lismer before, but this is, a, this is a difference because one of the reasons I felt guilty about Lismer was because I didn't actually like him very much. He was my least favorite of the group. And I just thought, well, you know, I haven't done him justice in Painting Canada, but actually I don't really like him. <laughs> well, here's the big news. I've finally fallen in love with Arthur Lismer. <laughs> 
the man is absolutely wonderful. And this, this display downstairs, I hope you'll agree with me, is, is truly remarkable. I think he's an extraordinary artist. Um, I've discovered the group's wider achievement. I was only interested in paintings for Painting Canada, but this collection is astonishingly rich in everything that they ever did. And so all of those works on paper, their draftsmanship, their printmaking, all of those things are represented in, in our collection, and that's been a great joy too. I still think, and I thought this at the time, 10 years ago, I still think that Carmichael is the most consistently excellent over the broadest range of, of media. I know it's, uh, you're, you're one supposed to feel guilty liking Carmichael best, but I still do. I still do, and I still think um, he is so remarkably a virtuoso over so many different kinds of media. There are, as I said, over 2,000 works in the collection, but the other thing I've discovered is that they're not all equally well represented, and that is interesting too. Uh, collections always have that imbalance embedded in them. And um, I can say firmly that Carmichael, Harris, Lismer, Jackson, Casson, and MacDonald, terrific, uh, completely wonderful sets of, of works by them. But I would just say that Varley particularly, I think, Johnston, Holgate, and Fitzgerald, not so much. Um, still, there's still a, a tremendous wealth of work by those artists, but we could do better by them. So if you've got a, a, a stash of barley hidden away somewhere, um, I'd be very grateful. Thank you very much. <laughs> that would be lovely. So I'll start now with my, my slides. Um, this is just a, a quote taken from, from the, um, the original catalogue for that first exhibition. I've got a nasty little um, copy here of it. It was just a small list, a list of works and an essay. And the essay was written by Lauren Harris himself. And um, I copied out the, the first paragraph, first of all. Um, at some point, one of the exhibition organizers here said, suggested that I might like to have this whole quote on the first panel. And I took one look at it and said, no, I'll have the first sentence, thank you very much. And I think you can see why. Um, the second sentence is, these seven artists, they're all imbued with the idea that an art, note the capital A, uh, Lauren Harris isn't capable of saying the word art without a capital A. They are all imbued with the idea that an art must grow and flower in the land before the country will be a real home for its people. Now, of course, there's been a, a, a considerable amount of critical uh, work done over the last three decades that deals with that, exactly that kind of unthinking colonialism. Because basically, it may have come as a shock to Lauren Harris, but the indigenous populations of Canada had been managing very nicely for many thousands of years before post-impressionism <laughs> flowered in the land. Um, but the point is, of course, no one would have thought twice about that kind of a statement um, at the time. And I think um, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt in the sense that the group of seven were working very much in a European tradition. Uh, landscape generally in the European tradition had been rather devoid of people as well. It was more likely to be about the sublime. Um, it's very difficult to criticize the group of seven because, because it doesn't register the existence of the indigenous population in the landscape. They were interested in the sublime. They were interested in the landscape itself as a way of, of evoking a, what they saw as a young country. So anyway, I, I spared you the second sentence on the storyboard, but there it is, and I've dealt with it now. And then the rest of the, uh, the essay, I have to say, make, make, makes me scream with laughter. Um, but it, it's really interesting. It's an interesting lesson. I've just copied some of the, the best there. You, just to show you where we got the title from. Actually, it's fairly ironic, the title of this exhibition, A Like Vision, because if you come out of this exhibition with any major idea, it will be that all of those artists are real individualists. They may have started with a like vision, but by gum, they're all very different. Now, here's some wonderful quotes for you. 
Um, it seems inevitable when something vital and distinctive arises that it would be met by ridicule, abuse, or indifference. So-called art lovers prefer to enrich the salesmen than accept the productions by artists native to the land. The Sikh is mine, incidentally, since um, three of them were from England. Just saying. <laughs> whose work is more distinctive, original, and vital, and of greater value to the country, the more sophisticated will say anything that sounds erudite, patting their own backs at the expense of art and country. And then the final paragraph, he says, a word as you view the pictures, the artists invite adverse criticism. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> Having insulted every, every possible visitor to the exhibition in every way conceivable, I'm not surprised if they got some kind of um, feedback from them on that level. It's bristling with self-righteous um, victimhood, if you like. Now, the thing is about that, I mean, I can laugh about it now, but he was up against a, a hostile press at that time. And the 10 years prior to the foundation of the Group of Seven, they'd had ample evidence of the way in which a reactionary press was going to react to anything new in, in art. And so it is a response to that. If you, if you remember, um, dear, gentle um, J.E.H. MacDonald had been accused of, of painting something that looked like the, the contents of a drunkard's stomach. This was one of the, 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 the milder forms of, of abuse that they had actually faced. So this was not, their defensiveness was not completely unjustified. But I think also that decade, 1910 to 1920, was a difficult decade. I think of it as the preparatory decade for the Group of Seven. They had been poised to launch actually much earlier than they did. I think around 1914 uh, was probably in, in Lauren Harris's head. Five of the original group, uh, plus Thompson, of course, Tom Thompson, and indeed Casson, who, who was around in the early days, who joined later, were colleagues. They, they were commercial artists. They worked um, for much of the time at, at Grip um, Limited commercial art firm, and then Rouse and Mann uh, after that. MacDonald was their mentor. He was the lead des designer at, at GRIP. And he left in 1911 from, from his, his job, his well-paid job, and took the risk incredibly, it was incredibly risky, in fact, at that time, to try for a career as, as an artist. The rest of them all carried on working, but they were all, they all knew each other. They were all friends. Jackson um, was in Montreal, and Jackson was clearly headhunted. He was effectively headhunted by Harris via uh, MacDonald and uh, with Dr. McCallum, who um, famously was one of the early supporters of the group and who bankrolled a lot of their early work. He was brought to Toronto. He was on the point of leaving. Jackson was on the point of leaving for <coughs> New York, tired of the Montreal art scene. But they tempted him. Uh, let's not put too fine a point on it. They bribed him to come to Toronto. McCallum actually uh, offered him a year's worth of subsidy, effectively, as he did to Thompson, to kind of get them established there. And even more concrete than that, um, Harris with McCallum, but mainly Harris's money, of course, um, Lauren Harris had built the studio building in Rosedale. This wonderful building is still there. You can go and look at it um, today. It's now, now a private house, but nonetheless, it was an extraordinary thing to have done. He built it as an expensive gesture to support creativity and solidarity between a new generation of artists. And it was intended clearly as to be the hub of a revolution in art. That was what Harris had in mind, and I think um, basically, he expected to launch that revolution in 1914. But there's the date for you, 1914. Um, the outbreak of war got in the way. Jackson um, enrolled uh, immediately and went off um, to war. Elsewhere, the Arts and Letters Club was functioning very much as a, as a, a conversation place, somewhere we, which fostered discussion amongst artists. It was all there. Everything was in place, if, had it not been for the First World War. Um, I say discussion. This was perhaps the, 
one of the eras of the most heated discussion in the, in the history of art, certainly in the 20th century, since the post-impressionist um, exhibitions in London in 1911 and 12 and at the Armory in New York in 1913, had completely pulled the rug out from, from any, any, any art that was familiar to anyone. It was a revolutionary time and those, those arguments were being had on a regular basis. So it was an exciting time to be an artist. But there was the First World War. And then, of course, in 1917, the death of Tom Thompson, who had been part of the group, would certainly have been a member of the group of seven. It might have been the group of eight, indeed, um, had he survived. By 1920, I think we can be sure that Harris, at least, was, was bristling with frustration uh, and had delayed this revolution that he had fostered so carefully. It's perhaps little wonder that he burst out of his corner with, with fists flying. Here's what this first exhibition looked like. This is the 1920 show. This was at the Art Gallery um, of Toronto, as it was then known. It's the Art Gallery of Ontario now, of course. And you can see it was a dense hang. I, I have, I'm not scared of dense hangs, as you probably noticed. <laughs> I come from a European tradition where we hung them high. Um, and I have to say, ours looks better. <laughs> now, the organization of the show is, again, very different from Painting Canada. Anyone who remembers that show is I, I organized that show geographically, interestingly enough, simply because and no one in England had any idea of Canada beyond the big cities. They just didn't know the districts. So, you know, having a wall with something in Algoma would have meant nothing. And so I had to actually arrange it geographically so that I could actually introduce the various areas of Canada that the Group of Seven painted. And of course, we know they covered much of the, much of the, um, of the ground by, the, by 1933. They'd covered a lot of ground. So it's not done by geography, nor is it done by theme. We toyed with the idea for a bit. Um, but again, we felt that was unnecessarily complicated and the, the breadth of work that we were working with didn't lend itself to a thematic arrangement. So we just went for the simplest possible arrangement, which is by artist. So each artist gets a room or a space within a room to themselves and that way you can get a, a, a really good appreciation of the artist's individuality and I think that's really the important thing. The order within those, uh, the hang is, is arbitrary. It's done aesthetically, again, as I hope you've noticed, um, so that it, it, there is no chronology really within, within each artist's room. Um, we just hung it to look as beautiful as possible. That's what I thought was the best way of doing it. Um, two artists bracket the show, and that mirrors Painting Canada very nicely. Uh, Painting Canada was bracketed by a room devoted to Thompson and a room devoted to Harris, and then between it was arranged geographically. Here, um, the, the list, the, the arrangement of artists is arbitrary in the sense that um, they're not in any particular order. You're not supposed to like any of them in, a, in any particular order. But they arranged themselves naturally to fit the spaces that we had. And um, consequently, the show is bracketed by Harris and by Carmichael. And the reason for that, it's not favoritism on my part, is because actually those two artists are, I think, the best represented in the collection by density of masterpiece. There are most masterpieces by those two artists. And so they get the, the long galleries. And then the rest of the artists work in between, in no particular order just so that it looks as beautiful as possible. Now, finally, let me get on to some, some, some of the artists. There he is, uh, Lauren Harris. Um, it was always said that there was no leader of the Group of Seven, but if there was no leader, he was it. <laughs> um, and the reason for that was sheer charisma. And I chose this image because um, usually you're so, um, you're so uh, taken by the hair that you don't notice the, the, the sheer charisma coming out of the man's eyes. And I think um, here you get a pretty good idea of what an extraordinarily driven person Lauren Harris was. He really did um, 
I think, drive the Group of Seven. I would then say that MacDonald was the kind of father figure of the Group of Seven. He was terribly important to it, but he was a, a, a more retiring character. And the other revolutionary, of course, was Jackson, I think. But it was, it was, it was Harris who did it. Now, let me get on to some paintings, finally. Um, this, again, this is arbitrary. I've chosen a few paintings to represent my favorites within each of the 10 artists. Snow Fantasy from around 1917. Um, I had, I'm, I'm grateful to Greg Humenuk for pointing this out to me. I had forgotten that there is a sketch for this in the AGO. And the thing about the sketch is that it's a slightly different shape. And I had never really taken this on board. I just thought, well, OK, it's a slightly different shape. He changed his mind. Actually, there are photographs of this painting um, early on, ar around 1917, when it was first displayed, that show that it was, in fact, a different shape. It's been cut down. And um, I can show you the AGO uh, uh, sketch. There it is. Now, by the magic of PowerPoint, I can also superimpose. The thing about um, Harris is that his sketches are always very accurate in terms of how he translated them to the final painting. Uh, they're often more or less identical, just one is smaller than the other. And so I was able to sort of superimpose this, and you can see that it's been cut down on three sides, at the bottom and, and at the two sides. Um, but that gives you a pretty good idea of what it looked like. Now, don't ask me why it was cut down. In my long experience in museums, which is now frighteningly something like 35 years <coughs> since I started, uh, when paintings have been cut down, my advice is to chercher whatever the, the French for interior decorator is. Because very often, um, and I, I have many examples of this, you may find this extraordinary, but often an owner will have a very beautiful frame that is a different size from the painting they happen to own. <laughs> and they'll cut the thing down to fit the frame. I've seen it many times. And uh, the other reason for cutting down a painting is that it doesn't fit over the fireplace. That's another one, quite common. Um, we don't know if that's the case. And the interesting thing is that the McIvers, who gave us this painting in 1963, I think it was, were friends of Lauren Harris's. He had given them a painting for their wedding, for instance. So he knew them w well enough. So it may just be possible. This is one of those occasions where the artist actually asked for it to be cut down. We don't know. Now, there may well be people in this audience who do know. If you do know, please tell me. <laughs> I'd love to find out. Um, I'm afraid I've succumbed to the usual uh, um, cliché of showing an example of a work by a Swedish artist called Gustav Fjärstad. Um, and this is Silence Winter from 1914. So it's, it wasn't, for instance, in the great Scandinavian show of 1913 that um, Lauren Harris and MacDonald famously visited in Buffalo. But that visit to the Scandinavian art show in 1913 was, was hugely influential for all sorts of reasons. Um, it was, you know, actually influential in terms of their subject matter, very briefly. So I think you can see that, that comparison here. It's, it's almost uncanny, actually. Um, he's doing a Fjärstad, is, is what Harris is doing in that painting. But the inspiration was really in encouraging them to believe that they could, in fact, create uh, a language, a Canadian, a, a, a Canadian landscape vision, something that was new and entirely appropriate to the land in which they, they lived. That was their aim. And the Scandinavian artists, the Swedes, the Norwegians, the Danes, had come up with just such a landscape tradition that didn't look like the rest of Europe, mainly because the place is always under snow, just like Canada, apparently. <laughs> Um, but they, they painted it differently and they created a language all of their own. And this was hugely inspiring to Harris and Carmichael because that's what they wanted to do. But I would just say that um, this actual influence, the influence of actually using um, this kind of imagery, was really very brief. It was actually very brief. Harris uh, moved on very quickly. Um, MacDonald did one or two like this as well, and so did Thompson. 
um, just through chatting, I think. He tried his hand at snow pieces also. But uh, all except Thompson, who died too young, of course, um, moved on fairly swiftly. And I think the catalyst, again, was Tom Thompson's death. Notice the date of, um, of, of La Lauren Harris's Snow Fantasy was 1917. 1917, of course, the, the year that Thompson died. And you may also have noticed, I'll go back actually, um, you may also have noticed the technique. He uses these slabs of color, uh, building it up almost like br a brickwork, the back. Now, if, you, if that reminds you of anything, it should be the Jack Pine, actually, by Thompson. I think it's one of these paintings where you sense the artists discussing with each other, exchanging ideas, trying out different techniques. It, that decade, that preparatory decade, you can almost hear the conversations going on between these artists. And uh, I think this was, this was one of them. After Thompson's death, uh, the artists were grief-stricken. MacDonald particularly um, had been a real mentor to Thompson and was, was hit very hard. And uh, MacDonald, Harris, Jackson, and Johnston then moved away from Algonquin because Algonquin was too, too much associated with Thompson and went on to Algoma. And in those years of Algoma, the three years that they were going regularly to Algoma in 1918 to 1921, those artists really worked through the legacy of Tom Thompson. Uh, it, it, it's very clear that that's who's in their mind. And the reason they were doing that was because they felt that Tom Thompson had almost stumbled on exactly what they were looking for, a, a unique Canadian visual language that didn't look like anything else. And it's interesting that at that moment, Harris stops painting kind of Scandinavian paintings. Let's move on again. It's good that, isn't it? <laughs> and here's another one, just because I like it. Um, just to show you, this is another artist. Um, I want you all to go away and Google. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> the name's Pekka Hallinan, and he's Finnish, and he's simply glorious. And no one's ever heard of him. Um, he's far less famous than Anaxeli Galin Kalala. And that's a name you don't say after a couple of glasses of wine, I can tell you. Akseli Galin Kalala is the famous Finnish artist, but Pekka Hallinan is hard on his heels. And again, a perfect example of that kind of Scandinavian snowscape. Moving on, obviously, to our most famous painting, arguably, Mount Lefroy in 1930. Harris had by then developed very much his own, la his own uh, language. Different, very different from any of the other group of seven. There's that sense of uh, Art Deco about it. It's like a piece of furniture, a carved piece, piece of furniture. The lines are simplified, the forms are, are simplified. And um, he's heading rapidly towards abstraction. And actually, you'll have noticed if you've been through the show, there's an example, which is that. This is actually the latest painting, I think, in the show. <coughs> abstraction by Lauren Harris. Now, if you bumped into that in a dark night, would you actually have guessed that was by Lauren Harris? Well, there you go. It is. From around 1967, he painted right into the end of his life. But the thing about it is, it's the same painting. It uses different colors, but he's just taken the shape of the mountain and uh, reproduced it as an abstract piece of geometry. But all of the elements there, notice, look, the round cloud here, the aureole of light around the cloud there, and even the semicircular patches of yellow down here. It, it's clearly a variation on exactly the same painting which I find absolutely fascinating. And it did, actually, clearly it was, I'm not the only person this has occurred to, um, because I took that photo last Monday, I think, um, in the artist cemetery. This is Lauren Harris's tombstone. And covered in snow, there you have it. Wow. Miniature Mount Lefroy. So. And again, my favorite, and I've chosen those two to show you. Um, I, I love Iceberg's Davis Strait. 
this painting and Mount Lefroy will be actually representing the Group of Seven in a, in a show in Frankfurt later this year. Um, I'm delighted that the Group of Seven are, are, are making inroads into Europe again this year, uh, organized by the National Gallery and the Art Gallery of Ontario. And we've lent incredibly generously, he said, <laughs> smiling through his tears, because in August, these ones have to come down and I have to rehang the whole show. <laughs> However, I'm not bitter. <laughs> but enjoy them, enjoy them while you can. Um, now, um, what next? Yes, I just thought I'd show you this. This is actually not in, in the show, but this leads us on, uh, you'll see why I've chosen it um, in a minute. Uh, this was another light bulb moment for Lauren Harris. He had gone through his Algoma phase, painting rather like Thompson, never quite identical, but multicolored, very beautiful sketches. There are several on display downstairs. But then he really, he moved on, he moved north. And Jackson describes in his autobiography how uh, Algoma was too detailed, there was too much richness of detail there for Lauren Harris's taste. He was always looking for a, a, a pared down approach to art. He wanted to be austere, and he found it on the North Shore of Lake Superior. And the reason he found it on the North Shore of Lake Superior is partly because it is actually a very austere and beautiful landscape, but also because wildfire had gone through it the year before. And so what was left was bare rock and burnt out trees. And he loved those kind of sculptural shapes and actually, trees become a thing for him, in the same way as trees are a thing for, for Lemoyne Fitzgerald, as I'm, I'm sure you noticed if you've been through the show. And he does this um, rather kind of um, organic approach to trees. And this is where Lismer comes in, because we have an astonishing archive of drawings by Lismer. He's a great draftsman. He does wonderful presentation drawings. He does wonderful sketches for finished works. But he also was a, kind of a cartoonist. He did caricatures and, and, and funnies, like Emily Carr did. Emily Carr was a very good cartoonist as well. And one set of works we have records uh, a tour, a sketching tour that Lismer did with Harris. And uh, there's a whole set of drawings, and there are nine of them on display in the Lismer section downstairs. So do go and have, have a laugh at them. They're very good. And this is called Babes in the Wood. And if you can see, there is Harris. You can always tell him by his aforementioned hair. <laughs> and there, because he's always very lanky, is, is Lismer in the foreground. And the joke is, of course, that they've actually stumbled on the kind of wood that Lauren Harris paints. Um, and these extraordinary kind of wriggling worm-like trees have hands and, and beaks and heads. And uh, it's, it's a joke at Lauren Harris's expense. I might add that these were sent to Harris. I mean, these came to us largely through the family. So Harris was part of the joke. And I, I do, I, I, I'm slightly relieved that, uh, that Harris, who, as I say, couldn't, couldn't think of the word art without a capital A, was not actually incapable of laughing at himself. He could find humor in it as well. And Lismer, um, because of these wonderful things, I've, I've included a lot of Lismer's comments uh, in, in uh, cartoon form throughout this presentation, partly because it does, it does remind us that th these were individuals, and they had a lot of fun, actually. And they saw the funny side of things as, as well. Uh, on the tree element, um, there is also in our collection, just another Wrigley tree thing just to show you. Um, I found this um, piece of paper in Lismer's handwriting. And it's a poem, but in case you can't read it, I've, I've uh, thoughtfully transcribed it for you. And it goes, ye brookers, he's talking about Bertram Brooker. Um, Ye brookers, and I think it's plural because he's thinking of Lemoyne Fitzgerald as well, who, who was a friend of brookers. Ye brookers and ye Harris, now listen all to me. You may have been to Paris, but you canna draw a tree. <laughs> These stunted apparitions with wildly waving arms are merely suppositions that give the public qualms. But take some consolation from the poet who wrote for thee. 
In the scheme of all creation, only God can make a tree. <laughs> this is, of course, a very famous poem by Joyce Kilmer. Um, it starts, I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. It's that one. And it ends, poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. So um, here we are again with, with some absolutely lovely images of Harris. This is, not a, this is not a comic one. This is a quick sketch of Harris sitting cross-legged in the doorway of his tent with his um, painting box on his knee. This is universal for all the group of seven. They would take a, a box with them with um, slits in the side so that you could actually slide your sketches into um, two grooves on either side. And you could have two or three sketches without them actually smudging each other. It was a carefully designed thing. Uh, not the most comfortable thing. I think yoga was obviously essential for all group of seven artists. There is a comic version, and this I, I love because uh, it gives you the idea of, of, Lauren, of, of the passion of Lauren Harris. He was forever waving his arms in the air, and his hair just got wilder by the minute. Uh, here he is explaining about art with a capital A. And finally, my favorite, Lauren Harris getting his hair cut, <laughs> which, which was you know, no task to be taken on lightly. Um, and I just love the expression of, of the barber, who is clearly on the point of suicide. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Lismer was on hand to record the humanity of the group of seven throughout. They, they all appear in, his, in, in these, these works at some time or another. Here is Beasts of Burden. This is Harris leading the way inevitably, and Lismer struggling along with his pipe behind up some terrible mountain. Uh, I love this one. It's called On Top, and you see uh, L Lauren effectively conducting the cosmos, which is kind of how I think he's, he saw his role as an artist. But just if you can see down there, um, this tells us where he is, in fact, because there he is. It's, it's the North Shore of Lake Superior. So this was, this was a sketching trip um, to that area of the world. And here's another lovely one, more, more like a punch cartoon, I think, this one. Uh, it's called The Artist Having an Isolation Peak. There he is, peeking round the corner. There's his painting, and whatever that is, um, is clearly uh, attracting more attention. So he's having an isolation peak. And of course, the, the play on words is, is due to that, the isolation peak spelled B-E-A-K, in the Rockies. That's a painting in the Hart House collection, a very beautiful painting. So there you go, there you have it. Now let's move on to MacDonald, the wonderful MacDonald. Um, the worst comb over in the history of mankind, but <laughs> apart from that, um, he, here he is again by Lismer. Uh, Lismer uh, really does capture all of the group of Group of seven, and they always show show them. The, unfortunately, the the um, studio portraits, the f photographs of the group of seven that exist, uh, they clearly didn't have a proper marketing person on their on their team, because um, they a they were never all seven in the same place at one time, and they all have very varying uh, levels of of studio photography done for them. Uh, so these are actually ter terrifically valuable Lismer's visions of, of them all. Um, MacDonald started uh, that preparatory decade, as I said, by leaving grip and taking the very risky decision to try and be a professional artist. Um, and in that decade, and you can see this very clearly down in the, in the exhibition, he tried his hand at various different styles. And I think it's quite simply a question he was a very, um, very good artist. He knew his stuff. He could paint anything. Uh, brilliant with a brush. But finding a market is a different matter. And so he tries his hand at very different types of painting um, to see if he can actually find a market that will, will keep him and his family. He had a young family to support, of course, the young Thoreau MacDonald. Um, and so here he is doing something. Uh, this isn't in the show, incidentally, but I, I just brought it up. On the warpath around 1913. And again, if you, if you saw this on the wall somewhere without a label, would you know that was by MacDonald? 
I don't think I would. Who is he looking at? Well, I think he's looking at Frederick Remington, hugely popular Western uh, and cowboy type artist. Um, I've been to the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. I loved it. It was wonderful. It had all sorts of Gary Cooper costumes and John Wayne's guns and oh, it was fabulous. But it had an awful lot of paintings by Frederick Remington. And Remington was a specialist in nocturnes, in night scenes. And I think that's exactly what um, MacDonald is trying out here. Because, of course, Remington was very popular, huge market for his work and sculpture. And then here's a harvest, a beautiful painting. It's one of my favorite paintings in the collection, actually. A harvest evening moon from 1917. Um, but again, it doesn't, it, it looks like an arts and crafts painting, is what it, to me. It looks like uh, um, something that you would see at the Royal Academy in London. It would have fitted in very nicely. And I can give you an example, and I make no apologies. Every time I do a talk, I seem to show something by this artist. Because I love George Clausen. I mean, I know perfectly well that no one else in, in, in this room has ever heard of him, he said. <laughs> I thought so. George Clausen, um, forgotten, I might add, in Britain as well. Had I stayed at Dulwich, there would have been an exhibition by now, I can tell you. I think he's a wonderful painter. But he does paint this kind of evocative, romantic view of, of rural England. And I think that's what MacDonald, who of course comes from Durham, you know, it's actually English background, was, was trying to evoke in these paintings. And actually, again, I think it's the death of Tom Thompson that changes everything for MacDonald. MacDonald, if you remember, was a poet. He wrote the inscription on the cairn that stands at Canoe Lake um, that memorializes Tom Thompson. It's a very beautiful piece of writing. Um, would that they had got him to write the catalog for the 1920 exhibition, but that's another issue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when Thompson died, uh, and he and Harris and Jackson and Johnston all went up to Algoma, as I say, they were working their way through um, Thompson's legacy. And this is the result. Um, MacDonald really finds his language uh, in Algoma, uh, really giving tribute to Thompson. Um, this could almost be a Thompson sketch. This, frankly, um, from 1919, I consider to be um, one of the very top masterpieces in the country, probably. It's an exquisite sketch. It has the most remarkable effect of looking as if it has light shining from behind it. It's, it's a true masterpiece. It's tiny, of course. It's the size of, a, of an iPad. But, to but MacDonald here becomes, after Thompson, the greatest master of the Canadian oil sketch. He, he really is um, exceptionally brilliant at it. And it leads, um, of course, to our um, undoubted masterpiece, the, the huge forest wilderness from 1921. This is uh, a view of Algoma from up on high. This was the thing that was learned in Algoma, was to stand on a high spot looking down over a panorama. Whereas before, uh, in Georgian Bay, for instance, you would be on, on ground level looking across a lake with a huge sky. In Algoma, they looked down. And this is the result, a, a really exquisite painting. Now, moving on to Varley. Fred Varley um, was from uh, Sheffield. Uh, I'm sorry, I sound like I'm obsessed with hair, but Varley's hair was really quite extraordinary. <laughs> Um, throughout his life, he had great hair, uh, you know. <laughs> it, it was a difficult life, you know, he, he was alcoholic, he, had, he suffered from depression, he, he was a terrible womanizer and um, generally a, a rather rackety personality, a great painter. But throughout, he had great hair. <laughs> now, there he is by Lismer. Uh, with the fag sticking out of mouth. But look at the hair, there it is. It's astonishing. He started um, really as a, as a fantastic war artist. Um, this is not in our collection, sadly. This is in the Canadian War Museum. But it's one of the great war paintings. In 1919, um, in London, at the Royal Academy, where I used to work, actually. It's where I started my career. 
they had an exhibition um, of the Canadian War Memorials Fund art. This was Lord Bre Beaverbrook, if you remember, who had set up this fund, basically um, to create the idea of the war artist. It had a, it had a double effect. One, it, it created a, a memorial of art as, to, to uh, a life-changing cataclysmic event, so it was valuable from that point of view, and that has carried on to the present day. But also, I think, uh, at the back of his mind, Beaverbrook was, was looking at a way to save a generation of artists from being cannon fodder. Jackson was actually wounded in the trenches. He, he fought in the trenches, as did Varley. But they became um, war artists and then could record the, the, the war in different ways. This is Varley in, in England, actually. Uh, this was part of the training of, of uh, soldiers for, for the trenches, because gas attacks were, were quite common in the trenches. And so they set up a sort of false a, a, a pastiche um, trench here, bombed it with gas, and they're testing the, 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 the gas mask. And he's turned it into this extraordinary image. Because this is, Seaford is a very famous um, uh, area of, of, of England with the, this one wonderful river that, that winds through the valley there. And it was painted by many, many artists. It's usually the, the meandering river that they're painting. So this was a well-known beauty spot. And he paints that exquisitely uh, beautifully. He's a wonderful impressionist painter at this point. And then has this, as it were, the mouth of hell in the foreground with this figure lurching ghost-like out of it. It's a wonderful piece. Um, Varley and Jackson, Jackson actually dominated that exhibition more or less entirely. He had paintings in every room and so was well known in, in England. And Varley must have actually made an impact as well. There are one or two paintings, including this one in that 1919 show that really must have stolen the show. Anyway, um, this is, I think, our uh, outstanding masterpiece, Early Morning Sphinx Mountain. No one else but Varley could have painted in those colors. He was a, a, an extraordinary colorist. Um, he, in, he used greens and pinks and reds and hot reds like no one else. And this, uh, as a vision of BC, is really quite extraordinary. And again, I make no apologies for making a comparison that I have made before, which is to the Swiss artist Ferdinand Hodler. If Varley wasn't aware of Hodler, then I don't know what. He should have been. I'm sure he was. I mean, Hodler painted the Swiss mountains particularly in a very dynamic and interesting way, unlike any other artist, I think. And I found this image really quite easily of the Jungfrau done in 1911 by Ferdinand Hodler, which could almost have been done by Varley, I think. Our other great masterpiece is this, Night Ferry, Vancouver. The date is interesting because it's 1937. Um, Fred Varley was invited to, to teach at the Vancouver School of Art in 1926. Uh, most of the Group of Seven at one time or another either continued their work as commercial artists or got involved in teaching. It's universal to all of them. Uh, Harris, of course, had the, the definite advantage of being a millionaire to start with. It always helps um, <laughs> as an artist. Um, Varley certainly wasn't. He was more or less penniless his entire life. Uh, um, and what he, what he earned, he kind of spent on drink and wine, women, and song. Um, but he had left uh, Vancouver. He suffered from um, depression. And uh, this drove him away from Vancouver in 1935. So he was, he was back. Uh, he was back east um, by this point. I might add, he left his wife and children behind in Vancouver. He abandoned them and came back to Toronto. And this is painted as a memory, therefore. It's a memory of uh, the ferry crossing he used to uh, do from the North Shore um, regularly. And it has a certain hallucinatory quality, quality to it, those psychedelic colors. Um, it really is extraordinary, that moon sailing, sailing overhead. And in the foreground, you see, figure there. Uh, even in the small selection I've got on one wall downstairs, that figure appears three times. I think it stands in for Varley himself. 
It's effectively a self-portrait. He's always present in these images. So this is a memory painting, a nostalgic memory of Vancouver, done by Varley at the peak of his powers. Now, of course, he's primarily known, even, even at the first exhibition in 1920, Varley's group of paintings was dominated by his portraits. There were four portraits in, in that exhibition. The only other artist who did that was Harris, actually, who, who exhibited portraits too. And this is, I think, our greatest one, the girl in red, just for the sheer um, coloristic joy of it, that extraordinary orange. And it does remind me of another famous Toronto painting um, in, the, uh, in the AGO, the Marchesa Cassati by Augustus John. Now, you have to remember that um, Varley had left England in 1912. Uh, having basically been penniless and struggling very much at that point. Lismer had gone the year before, and he bumped into Lismer on the streets of Sheffield, who was back visiting family, and Lismer had persuaded him uh, to come to Toronto as well. So he, it was through Lismer that Varley arrived as well in 1912 and joined Grip immediately uh, as well. He fell into a job straight away. But he would have been aware in 1912, I think, of Augustus John, who at that time was the kind of superstar, the bohemian superstar of, of British uh, art. Uh, notorious in a way that would have chimed with Varley, actually. Um, Augustus John, great drinker, uh, someone who in the, the first decade of the, the 20th century was particularly known for touring the countryside in a gypsy caravan with his wife and mistress and their children. Um, they all loaded up in the caravan and he put on his berry and grew a beard and was basically toured the country be doing, doing bohemian things. So he was a model, if you like, and for an unfortunate role model for Fred Varley. <laughs> but even Fred didn't get a gypsy caravan, I mean, for heaven's sake. Now we move on to Jackson. Um, there really aren't any good photos of Jackson, I'm sorry. Um, he, he was a, such a fascinating man, but he wasn't Bonnie. There he is standing in front of um, our painting, the, the wonderful first snow, Algoma. And Lismer provides us with a couple of alternatives. <laughs> there he is, ready for hiking up a mountain. And nobody hiked up mountains like Jackson. He covered every inch of Canada. He went where other artists didn't dare go. Um, he was quite extraordinary. Uh, and there is a wonderful... Um, side view of, of him and his double chins. <clears throat> and again, this is one of my favorite Lismer images of him. This is uh, Monsieur Jackson à son travail. <laughs> uh, Jackson is there, wearing a berry, completely surrounded by an audience uh, who are um, leaning over him. And the, the fascinating thing is that this figure here, of course, you recognize him instantly, insanely tall with the pipe. This is Lismer, again, actually on site. And the thing that struck me, and I, I'll, I'll put it up, but I have no idea whether, in fact, this would be as well known to a Canadian audience as it would be to a European audience. But does that mean anything to you all? <laughs> Monsieur Hulot by Jacques Tati. Um, I, well, what can I say? This is from the 1950s, but it looks to me like Monsieur Hulot may have been uh, based on, on Arthur Lismer. <laughs> and Jackson is represented in the collection by some uh, hundreds, hundreds of drawings. Jackson used his sketch pad like we would use our iPhones these days. Anything that caught his eye, he would quickly sketch. So there are hundreds and hundreds of drawings, and he draws fluently and quickly. And they're, they're to stimulate his memory. They're for use later on. These are not beautiful drawings, though he is a wonderful draftsman. They're not there for their beauty. They're there to remind him of things. And it's often said that the Group of Seven don't paint people. Well, they certainly draw them. And there are lots and lots of sketches of people in Jackson. This is uh, crossing Great Slave Lake. This is in Cobalt. Ontario, and we'll talk about Cobalt a bit later. Um, he went there in 1932, I think, in 1934, a silver mining town, 
um, and drew some wonderful uh, images very quickly of, of that extraordinarily picturesque and slightly ramshackle town. And he did also a wonderful um, sketch, which we, I, I haven't put on display, but I thought I'd show it here, of cobalt. A different kind of thing for, for Jackson to be painting. They didn't always paint the wild wilderness, the lone pines, the, 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 the lakes and mountains. They did do quite a lot of urban stuff as well. Oops. And uh, he, his eye caught a, a crap game in 1927 and recorded it very quickly. Studies, there are lots of studies of horses with sledges or carts. Um, he was fascinated in this case clearly by the business of getting a horse, a, a sled up a hill and the way it, it alters the balance of the legs and how the sledge runners work. And he just set himself to capture that. And then in 1928 uh, and then again in 30, he went up to the Arctic. Again, typically Jackson. He managed to persuade uh, the, the government to, to allow him to go up on the Beothic, which was the supply ship for the, the, Royal, um, for the RCMP up in, up in the far north. And he did it by saying you know, that he would paint the furthest north um, point of Canada, and then it could hang in the minister's office, and they fell for it. And he, so he went, and then went again in 1930 with Harris in tow. Eventually, even Varley went up to the Arctic in 1938. But what is fascinating to me is that while on the Beothic, every time he looked from the deck, the sketchbook would come out. If he saw anything that caught his eye, whether it was icebergs in the, in the harbor off the Bash Peninsula here with the Beothic in the, in the background there, oops, um, pressing the wrong thing, sorry, in there, but these floating icebergs, he's caught them very quickly and Beachy Island from the deck of the boat. He's just caught it very quickly. And you'll notice there are little inscriptions as well. He noted color, uh, color notes, and anything that he thought would remind him of what he had seen. So this has been one of the revelations of the exhibition for me, is discovering Jackson as a draftsman, as a recorder of, of daily life. Here he is again doing something not, something that you don't associate with a group of seven. Uh, an industrial scene. He's fascinated by picturesque buildings that aren't of, you know, in the absence of Gothic cathedrals, what are you supposed to do? So you, you paint mines is the answer to that in Canada. It's, it's part of a kind of uh, nostalgia for pioneering industries, you know, whether it's um, fur trapping, but in mining, of course, is one of the key pioneer industries of Canada. The man himself, Lismer, now, of course, you, normally you see him without any hair, so I put th that in. <laughs> this, is, this is him at grip, so it must be around 1910, 1911, something like that, as a young man. Um, and I was fascinated to see that he's reading Punch. Uh, it's, it's not a surprise when you've seen some of the, the, the funnies that he himself drew, but he obviously was, should have been working clearly, but it, this may be, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. This is his lunch hour and he's reading Punch. And incidentally, it's the coronation edition. So we should be able to date it precisely. It must be George V. And again, this image of himself as this incredibly tall, lanky person. And in case you're wondering, that is Emily Carr. slightly patronizing, let's say, but we now know that as tall as Lismer was, Emily Carr was tiny. She was a tiny person. I'm sure she's not quite as small as that. Of course, she came to um, Ottawa and Toronto in 1927 uh, for a major exhibition in, in Ottawa and met all the Group of Seven at that point, made friends with Lauren Harris, who communicated with her by letter um, the rest of his life, really, I think, and the rest of his, her life, I should say, but met them all and was very much encouraged by them. This is the moment at which Emily Carr goes back home and takes off her brushes again after a period of about 15 years, not painting. Our most famous painting, Bright Land, 1938, um, a large painting, but actually it's these that I've fallen in love with. It, this uh, rep, um, reproduction doesn't do it justice at all. You have to go downstairs and see it on the wall. Canadian Jungle from 1946. 
while the rest of the group were looking you know at the pine tree itself against the lake or with a with the sky above Lismer focused on the on the roots he was interested in the kind of gnarly details of the rocks of Georgian Bay and um, produced a series of sketches of Georgian Bay that are amongst the best I think of the of the many sketches of Georgian Bay that the artist did. Um, Georgian Bay was a hugely inspirational place for them, largely because of the weather, I think. You know, vast expanses of water, these wonderful uh, Canadian Shield rocks sticking out of, the, out of the water, and the pines on them, but the wind, it's the wind, the west wind of Tom Thompson that really caught them. And this is a, a, an extraordinary uh, vision by Lismer of the weather of driving snow across across the uh, across the um, the bay, and again a kind of gnarly version looking down into an inlet with all of those difficulties. He saw it really as a as a technical challenge, I think, and it's always worth remembering about Lismer that he is a teacher, and that's um, terribly important for him. Uh, I, I value him particularly as a teacher. He actually covered as much ground as Jackson in, in, in many ways, but as an educator, he was very much in demand as an educator. He set up schools all over the place. He taught art. People still remember him to this day. Um, a friend of mine in Montreal, who's now in her, her 80s, was taught by, by Lismer and remembers him as a kind and, and, and wonderful teacher. There's a drawing to give you an idea of a different kind of drawing, a presentation drawing. It's the sketch, clearly, for Pine Rack below, which is a work in watercolor, which those, both of those are, are in the show. Wonderful draftsman. And no one ever caught Sumac, I think, quite as well as, as Lismer. These are beautiful paintings. The sketch on the left, the final painting on the right. And again, both of these are in the show and uh, are wonders. They're really glorious paintings. As I say, I've fallen in love, finally. And here's my first love, Franklin Carmichael. Um, unfortunately, the, the, um, the, the studio portraits make him look a bit like a sheep. But here is Lismer. Now, thank goodness for Lismer at this point, because there you've got it. Um, Franklin Carmichael with his pipe in his mouth cross-legged on some kind of bed or other, drawing away, absolutely focused on what he's doing. It's a little glimpse of, of real life, and it, to me, it, it tells you everything you need to know about, about Carmichael, that um, quiet, focused, brilliant artist. And I've, I'm, I will be, one of the things about putting up works on paper on display in an exhibition is that you can't leave it up all year, because works on paper have to be rotated. You can only leave them up for about three months. Otherwise, they get too much light. So I will be moving on um, to, to his printmaking, because I love his woodcuts. This is a wood engraving. Now, that's a very specific technique. It's very hard. You, know, you work on the grain of the wood, and um, the wood is very hard wood, so you have to use engraving tools on it. And he illustrated a, a book by Grace Campbell, The Thorn Apple Tree. And he, he illustrated it in wood engraving. And this is just one of them. And I think it's just a, a lovely thing. They're tiny. I mean, these are really small book illustrations. This is for The Higher Hill, another book that he, he illustrated. And this is more decorative. I mean, it, this is just an end paper. Um, he had little vignettes at the top of each chapter. And they're very beautiful, um, lovely little things. These will come out later in the, in the run of the show. Now, who knew? that Franklin Carmichael did abstraction. Well, he did. And the only reason I know is because we own one here, at the McMichael. And I came upon, the, upon this quite early on in my career here. Gambit number one, which suggests that, you know, it was a bit of a risk for him. He was under influence, of course, from Harris, who was in full abstraction mode at this point, as was Fitzgerald, in fact. A lot of pressure on artists at, in the 40s in the 30s in England, but in the 40s in Canada, to, to really embrace abstraction. And he has a go, and I have to say, it's a really rather lovely painting. This doesn't do it justice. I think he did it rather well, but the date is significant, 1945. Um, this was the year he died. 
he died young. He died at 55. And I think it was a terrible, a really terrible loss, like MacDonald dying too, too young. Now, I have got a selection of his drawings um, out at the moment, and this wonderful watercolour, because, of course, Franklin Carmichael is often described as a great watercolourist who also happened to do oil painting. And I really want to reverse that, because I think he was great at everything he did, but he was also an exceptional watercolourist, like uh, Casson, who was his um, assistant. And this is a very beautiful uh, watercolour. He, he's in Cobalt in 1930, and we've put up a, a, a series of the drawings he did in Cobalt, because they're very beautiful. There's something Art Nouveau about them. I think they remind me of Charles Rennie Mackintosh a little. Um, and they are a wonderful sequence of drawings, so don't miss them. He was an exceptional draftsman as well as everything else. But he also co-founded the, um, the Ontario Society of Watercolors in 19, Watercolorists in 1925, along with Casson and um, Brigden. Um, so he's, he's, a, he's a seminal character in the history of Canadian art. Why Cobalt? Well, I was, I was talking to a, a gentleman earlier who just happened to, um, to introduce himself to me uh, down in the Great Hall, who explained <laughs> to me why Cobalt. It's very nice that he should do so before my talk. Um, but actually, I was wondering why was Carmichael the first artist to go to Cobalt, and why? And the answer is, of course, that he wasn't the first artist to go to Cobalt. The women were there first. Yvonne McCaig Hauser was there in 1916. She discovered cobalt. And various other artists, including Prince Hewitt, I think, went there also to paint it. Why? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, in 1930, cobalt was dying down. In 1910, it was the fourth largest silver producer in the world. But by 1930, the mines were kind of closing down. It had a kind of ramshackle air to it. And I think that those women artists had responded to a kind of industrial scene which they recorded and recorded as a kind of picturesque uh, painting. Carmichael had seen their work because um, in 1930, the four women who had been to Cobalt and had recorded uh, Cobalt were invited to exhibit at the um, Group of Seven exhibition that year. Uh, and their paintings of Cobalt were on display. Carmichael clearly saw those works and decided he must go too. There you go. Bumping into someone in the front hall. Thank you if you're here. <laughs> um, so now we know. And he made some wonderful paintings of it. And I'm just fascinated by wh why this should be considered picturesque and then stumbled on this in The Guardian last week. Um, the last piece of the skyline, the battle to save Canada's prairie castles. Of course, these are not these aren't mines, these are, these are grain elevators, but the similar kind of architecture and the similar reaction to them as elements of the picturesque of a very specifically Canadian kind. And the Group of Seven are nothing if not in pursuit of specifically <coughs> Canadian subject matter. Um, I put this in as a, just as a, a joke, really, because I, I told you how we had things associated with the Group of Seven. We have 35 of Franklin Carmichael's engraving tools. <laughs> if, you, if anyone ever wants to do an exhibition of Franklin Carmichael's graving, engraving tools, we've got them. They're all here. And they're all rather sculptural and rather wonderful. And it just illustrates the point really nicely how beautiful, uh, how wonderful an engraver was, he was. Uh, his work is really exceptional. But so are his sketches, and um, I would cheerfully disappear with this one. And um, I've got a trustee in the front row here. He didn't hear me say that. Uh, but this is such a beautiful thing. Uh, his sense of color is unique and um, so decorative and so beautiful. And here, um, this gorgeous full-size painting by him. I love the way he deals with clouds, like as if they're sort of shards of glass. And although I always advise people never to project anything onto artists unless you actually have something in writing to prove that it is, I'm sorry, I can't help it, but I can see a bird taking off. There's its beak, there's its wings. I've broken my own rule. I'm sure that's what it is. Anyway, 
very, very beautiful. Um, the light shining out of this painting has to be seen to be believed. It really is lovely. Now, Frank Johnston looking like everyone's bank manager. <laughs> but Lismer comes to the rescue again with a quick sketch. And in this, although he was clearly always, shall we say, top heavy, I think, Frank Johnston, here at least he's got, uh, you know, he's got a floppy bow and some stripy trousers and a, 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 a Tom Thompson flop of hair, so he looks like a proper artist, finally. Um, interestingly, he's carrying a sketch of Franklin Carmichael. <laughs> so a little portrait there. Now, Johnston is fascinating. And this is one of the revelations of looking into our collection. Johnston was a prolific artist. Um, he, of course, is, is uh, slightly the dark horse in the, in the group of seven because he um, was part of the group. He was at GRIP. He was at Rouse and Mann. He had trained in Germany like Harris had. He was friends with them all and, and signed up in, in March 1920 at uh, Harris's uh, Queen's Park Mansion. They, they signed up as the group of seven. And um, he clearly was on board at that point. The year before, there had been a show of their Algoma work. In other words, those four artists who had been to Algoma put on a, a, an exhibition of the, the Algoma-themed works. And Johnston had provided the most of any of the artists. There were 60 works by him in that little show. And then in the 1920 show, there were 17 works by Johnston, which was much more than anybody else. He really was prolific. Now, the remarkable thing about it was that in the winter of the same year of 1920, Johnston put on a show at Eaton's, the, the department store, 200 works by him. Now, of course, the point was that, possibly because of what Lauren, Har because Lauren Harris had insulted anyone who might actually want to buy a painting, um, nobody really bought anything from the Group of Seven's first show. I'm just smattering. Um, but that big show at Eaton's, Frank Johnson did very well, thank you. And I think at that moment he decided that basically he was better on his own. In 1921, just a few months later, he went off to Winnipeg to, to become principal of the School of Art there and stayed until 1924. When he returned, he formally uh, resigned from the Group of Seven. He only exhibited that once. So of the, the, the many, the eight exhibitions that the Group of Seven put on, uh, Johnston contributed only 17 paintings in that very first exhibition and then left. And ironically, of course, um, in terms of financial gain, Johnston was the most successful of all of them, apart from Harris, who inherited millions. So um, he followed his own star. And it is interesting, therefore, that despite that being so incredibly prolific, we have a good selection, but not a huge selection, of his beautiful Algoma work. The Algoma work um, looks is when he looks most like a member of the Group of Seven, not surprisingly. He's doing the same subject matter, more or less. But in the 1930s and 40s, he developed this range of works that look at water and snow in a highly realistic, very virtuoso manner. Now, it's too easy to dismiss these as chocolate boxy. And I think we need to look at them again. And we've brought them all out because, interestingly, the McMichael has a really rather good selection of them. And half of the Johnston display is dedicated to these <laughs> wonderful paintings. And I love dark waters. And again, I'm sorry to do this to you, but I'm absolutely sure that in following the market, Johnston is thinking of a very particular, very successful, highly collectible Norwegian artist. <laughs> Fritz Taulo. Fritz Taulo uh, trained in Germany and actually ended up in Paris. So he he's effectively a kind of um, impressionist realist, I suppose. And he was an absolute specialist in snow paintings and water. And he was eminently collectible. And I'm quite sure that um, Frank Johnson must surely have been aware of Taulo's work and was 
feeding a very particular market that must have been relatively lucrative for him. But he's always odd, Johnston. I, he's been rather neglected, I think, Frank Johnston. I, it's difficult to find anything much about him uh, because he doesn't fit the mold. He doesn't look like the Group of Seven ever, really. Here he is in Algoma, painting something so black and, and bleak looking, whereas, you know, the others were painting in a riot of color uh, at this point. And here you have this curtain of black trees. Now, it, this is actually gouache. You wouldn't know it. It's a large gouache, but it has been marouflaged onto a board. Oh, oh, sorry, onto a stretched canvas, and that can be a very damaging thing to do. The fascinating thing, and I encourage you all to go, to go down, and you'll have to kind of crane a bit to look, but in there, you will see, if, you, if the light's hitting it at the right angle, um, there is the kind of ghost of a moose in there. Now, whether he painted that out, looks kind of like he may have done that, he just wanted a bleak landscape, or whether in fact it came away in the marouflage process and he then painted it out. I don't think we'll ever know. But interestingly, it, it, it looks like a symbolist landscape to me and the, the, the painting that it instantly reminded me of uh, was this, um, a very fair, I don't know how well you can see that, I'm sorry the light's shining in it badly, but this is Arnold Birklin, who is Swiss, um, and uh, this is one of the most famous paintings of the 19th century. It was in Germany, and he did several versions of it because it was much in demand, and it's called The Island of the Dead. And what it is is the, you know, the, the, the boat of the, the ferryman carrying a soul there over to the Island of the Dead, and it has the same kind of curtain of these dark cypresses in front of it highly symbolic and, and influential painting. Much loved by Norwegians, interestingly enough, so I wonder if he knew of it. He trained in Germany, Johnston, so it's more than likely he did. Anyway, there you go. Kassen, and we're getting on now, um, the youngest of the group of seven. He joined in 1926. As I said, Johnston uh, left in 1924. And Casson was brought in in 1926 to take his place. Casson was, uh, was Carmichael's assistant, um, first at Rouson Mann and then at Samson Matthews. The two of them moved to Samson Matthews, which was a printmaking concern. And both of them, uh, Carmichael was the head of design there and um, Casson was his uh, assistant. Eventually, uh, Casson stayed on and became president of that company right up until the 1940s. And so he, he had a very thriving commercial art career throughout. And he's often um, dismissed for that reason. This is the figure that we kind of know. He, he lived into his 90s. And so Casson was still alive in 1990. He was very much part of the history of this place because he and his wife Margaret were dear friends of the McMichaels. And so they visited here many times. And Casson had a tremendous influence on, on Robert McMichael and the way they put together the collection. So he is a, a seminal force in the way this, this, this institution came together. And he painted right up to the end, more or less. And again, Lismer provides you with an image of the young Casson uh, sitting with MacDonald, uh, a nice, a beautiful little glimpse of the two of them. He starts out um, as a very young man, 1920, he's about 20, 21, uh, painting very much, I think, uh, in, in the manner of Lauren Harris. Uh, this comparison seems to me to be pretty um, persuasive. Uh, lovely sketch by uh, Lauren Harris from 1916 and Casson doing the same thing at Lake Rosso in 1920. And this painting, which is one of our great paintings by Casson, is also in, in many ways, it's kind of, um, if you were being unkind, and I, this is not my, my opinion at all, but I've heard this described as kind of um, group of seven by numbers. You know, it, it's got all the qualities. It's got the Casson dead trees. It's got um, 
It's got uh, Franklin Carmichael's sky up there. It's as if he's come to get, put, a, put an amalgamation of those two artists, particularly, to produce this absolutely classic Group of Seven image of um, the North Shore of Lake Superior. But I think it's, what makes it special is the drawing and the color. That's Kasson in a nutshell, drawing and color. He's really remarkable. This is probably his most famous painting uh, of ours. It's become an icon of the McMichael. Interestingly, it was originally a small painting. Um, over there, that's the little tempera. He painted in tempera. Johnston did, his t did too. It's quite a rare medium, quite, quite difficult to do. And um, I think it was McMichael asked him to do a, a full oil version on canvas, which he did later, a decade later, and it's become one of our most famous paintings. It's this kind of thing in the 1940s that I find most fascinating, almost um, abstract, uh, very austere in its color, very beautiful in its drawing. Um, I, I have such a lot of time for Kasson. I think he's often underestimated. And I absolutely have, make no apology for utterly loving this painting. And this is the group of seven really coming right into, into the 1960s. This is 1965. You know, I was 10 when he painted this, and he's still painting like a, a, a group of seven artists, but very special. He paints trees like feathers here, and these are like sort of shards of jade. I, the color is exceptional. It's a very, very beautiful painting. This slide gives you no idea of its tremendous beauty. And just as a, a little reminder, um, he discovered Kleinberg a long time before the McMichaels did. Uh, and uh, this is one of his legacies, is that he, he drew rural um, towns in, in Ontario. He went round recording vernacular architecture uh, all the time. And so we have a wonderful record of beautiful drawings by Kasson um, of small towns just like Kleinberg. And this building, I might add, still exists. It's the old general store. It's, for the last three years, it's been being renovated. And apparently this summer it's due to open as, guess what? A restaurant. Because what Kleinberg needs is a seventh restaurant. <laughs> Mustn't grumble. Edwin Holgate with his kiss curl. Um, and I've put in this wonderful um, self-portrait by him because he was a great portraitist. He joins the Group of Seven. He's invited to join in 1929, um, the second of the, of the three latecomers to the group. And he was, he was an obvious person to invite because he had a national reputation by this point. He was very famous in Montreal, where he's based, and uh, famous for several things. But portraiture was definitely one of them. But you can see why the Group of Seven would want to invite him to join uh, this lovely landscape in, uh, of 1930. The Baie des Moutons uh, hangs very happily next to um, Franklin Carmichael's views of panoramas, in fact. He was also, a, like Carmichael, was a great um, printmaker. And this is a woodcut. He actually taught woodcut at Montreal uh, School of Art there, and it is a speciality of his. He's another great um, woodcutter. And he is famous for being the only one of the Group of Seven who had a reputation for painting the nude. So there are some wonderful, this lovely sculptural thing. It's not quite as uh, jaundiced as this looks. Um, they, they are wonderful <coughs> sculptural figures. He was a very great draftsman. And I love these. We're lucky to have them. Two portraits of his wife, Frances. I say that. Uh, the one on the left is definitely a portrait of Frances. Um, he and his wife always refuse to call this a portrait of Frances, although it is, in fact, Frances, because actually what had happened was that um, she was out gardening one day and had wrapped a towel around her head. And he was so s taken with the way she looked in the towel um, that he painted her like that, but really what he's doing is, you know, painting a woman with a towel around her head. Um, because it, it kind of reminded him of, um, of a, a sort of genre piece, if you like. It was like, you know, there are figures in Giotto that have that kind of uh, 
towel around their heads or, or, or a nun. It looks, she looks like a Russian peasant of some description. So it's not the personality that matters here, it's the form. Anyway, we're lucky to have them, but they're both small and they're both beautiful. And this is his most famous work in our collection, um, The Cellist from 1923. And the date instantly caught my eye. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, to wear you out on this level, but this is how my mind works. The, uh, 1923, um, Augustus John painted this very famous painting between 1920 and 1923. And I'm willing to bet it appeared in Studio Magazine. And probably Holgate saw it there. But look at the difference between the two. You couldn't want a, more, a clearer difference. A, Holgate fill, has the figure filling the whole of the, of the surface of the, of the canvas. So that she's right up to the edge. He's focused on her concentration and on the very precise holding of her hands. I expect a cellist could tell you exactly what chord is being played there. It's very precise. John, on the other hand, does the Lady Gaga version. <laughs> Never one to shrink away from a bit of theatricality. And finally, Gary Cooper. No, sorry, this is Le Lemoyne Fitzgerald. The only one of them who managed to get a really good um, portrait done of himself. Uh, he has the hat on, of course, because he's going bald by this point. But anyway, there he is, Lemoyne Fitzgerald. And of course, he's not, he's not very well represented in, in this particular display because we have the largest Lemoyne Fitzgerald show ever put together on the top floor here. So we feel like we've done him proud. This is my co-curator, Sarah Milroy, and I um, have done Fitzgerald for the ages. Uh, and so apart from anything else, that means most of our Fitzgeralds are out touring because that show is going on to Winnipeg and then to Calgary. It's touring. So a lot of our uh, really great things will be, will be gone. But it gave me a chance to bring out this, which I love, The Harvester from 1921 where Lemoyne Fitzgerald is, is clearly channeling um, Van Gogh. Uh, and again, that reminds you of something. As with Lismer, uh, Lemoyne Fitzgerald is a teacher. Um, and so he tries on other styles for size. He, he paints like Cezanne, he paints like Van Gogh because he admires them. And he's explaining these things to generations of young students. Um, you can always tell a teacher. And that brings us to the end. And Lismer has, again, the final word, a sketch done in 1933. Because, of course, Lemoyne Fitzgerald got a letter from Lauren Harris on the, at the beginning of May 1932, inviting him to join the Group of Seven. And the next letter came on the 1st of January 1933, telling him that the Group of Seven had been disbanded. So he was a member of the group for precisely eight months. What had happened? Well, sadly, what had happened was that MacDonald had had a second fatal stroke in November of that year and had, had died, obviously, in November. And I think once the father figure of the group had gone, the wind was out of their sails. And actually, it was decided that the Group of Seven needed to go on. It needed to develop at that point. Um, they had been inviting other artists to join them in their, in their group shows, but still um, it was a boys club, uh, very much so. I mean, even Jackson r says, you know, the, the group of seven was like the Twelve Apostles. Apparently they all had to be male. Um, and things had changed. By 1932, they had wrought the revolution that they set out to do in 1920. They had arrived there, and in fact, irony of ironies, they had effectively become the art establishment that they had sought to replace. So, with the death of MacDonald, it was decided that the next phase needed to be embarked on. The Group of Seven, uh, here lies the Group of Seven. It was decided to disband, but please notice, up here, the tree growing from, un, from the ground by the gravestone is full of little birds. And he's labeled them, the fledglings. 
and there are little flowers growing up as well. This is clearly a reference to the fact that he felt that the group of seven had, ef had effectively created the fertile ground from which um, a new generation of art would grow. And in, to be precise about it, what next happens is the creation of the Canadian group of painters. Also in 1933, with Lauren Harris as its first president. And that group had 28 members, so literally four times the size. All of the surviving group of uh, seven were part of the, the Canadian group of painters. And nine, hallelujah, nine of the group of, of that 28 were women. So finally they were getting that recognition that they had been denied through the original group. So here lies the group of seven, but in fact Lismer couldn't possibly have known at that point. But of course, there he is, next to Harris, uh, with Johnston beside him, and Jackson on this side, and Varley. Um, the artist's cemetery was an idea that came that uh, Jackson, who lived here for the last six years of his life, came up with, with Casson. Um, the McMichaels had always, with their negotiations with the province, they had always wanted to be buried on their property here. But Casson and Jackson came up with the idea of the artist cemetery. It's part of a kind of um, a, a sort of hagiographical development for the group of seven. Jackson took it on himself really to ensure their legacy. And uh, so with the McMichael's help, they put together this great collection to celebrate the group of seven at a moment where possibly they were being not quite forgotten, but where they weren't revered as much as Jackson clearly thought they should be. And so they, they came up with the idea of the artist cemetery and six of the group with their wives um, are, are buried in our grounds. Thank you very much.